Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd start off with a little bit of background, but I think over the day, um, we kind of went through everything. So um, yeah, I'll just go through it really quickly. As we know, the main sort of categories of heart valves that we've been using clinically are really just mechanical valves. And then we have biprosthetic valves and homographs. Um, I think all of the <laughs> drawbacks have already been mentioned. The one thing I wanted to point out was with mechanical valves, we don't have any small sizes available. And so when it comes to pediatric patients, this can become a restriction. Um, I am aware that we don't really use mechanical valves in pediatric patients, but just as a synthetic replacement, being able to accommodate the sort of um, sizes that um, patients can have uh, is ultimately an advantage. So. Uh, with the clinical uh, heart valve replacements that we have, ultimately the drawback really comes from their durability. So the poor durability. And so our goal really is to be able to produce um, a synthet synthetic heart valve that can last in the body, ideally for a lifetime. Uh, so current substitutes are especially problematic as we've seen from data. Um, for younger patients. So we actually see that the failure rates seem to be a lot higher. Uh, of course, another drawback is the high cost associated with the procedure, you know, the surgical procedure and everything. Uh, but the one thing that really sets apart uh, children from adults, as we know, is the fact that they grow. And because of the somatic growth, they require multiple reoperations over their lifetime. Um, and this comes with a lot of risks. So, um, one of the, I guess, possible solutions, um, I think as Elena um, explained to us, is tissue engineering. So uh, one of the most common methods is like in vitro tissue engineering, where we take a synthetic uh, construct, we can seed it with cells. These cells can be of autologous origin if they come from the host. Uh, we can grow the construct in a bioreactor under the correct conditions for a specified amount of time. And in the end, we end up with a living construct. And this living construct, uh, the suggested, I guess, uh, advantages are that one, it can be of autologous origin and two, um, the potential for growth because, because it is living. However, uh, up to date, there really is no proof that these valves work, especially in the long run. And a lot of that has to do with the lack and understanding of molecular pathways associated with things like neo tissue formation. Uh, so remodeling and also the degradation of the scaffold. And it doesn't help that there's also this individual to individual variable response, which means if you put the same tissue engineered heart valve in patient A, B, and C, um, they may not necessarily degrade at the same time nor remodel at the same time. And so it becomes very difficult to control and therefore predict the fate of the valve. However, I do believe <laughs> that tissue engineering is definitely one of the potential sort of leading solutions for the future. Just as of right now, we feel that uh, we really need a valve that is made from a thin bioinert material. So essentially something that isn't really interacting with the body. It's almost like the complete opposite of tissue engineering. Um, and I guess optimally lasting in the body for a lifetime. Of course, that is a very uh, long end goal. Um, we also want to put more focus on the valve design. So a lot of papers look into the different types of biomaterials that can be used potentially for heart valve replacements, but not a lot of them put a focus on the valve geometry, for example, the shape of the leaflets. So we want to put um, more of a focus on this aspect as well as the um, biomaterial and also making it biomimetic. So as close to the native um, geometry as possible. Um, so we believe that this valve design really needs to go beyond the um, tissue, uh, tissue valves that we're using in the clinic at the moment. So the ones that have existing so flat leaflets that are really mounted and they sort of form this curvature because of the way that they are mounted. They're, they're not made with a curvature. And the reason I explain curvature now is because it is one of the design aspects that we are really focusing on um, in our valve design. So Thankfully, this is something that I don't think many people have touched on today. So um, I'm really focusing here on the pulmonary heart valve because it is a valve that has been affected a lot in congenital heart diseases. So with the pulmonary heart valve, uh, it actually has a unloaded natural curvature, meaning um, in its sort of resting position when there is no load being exerted upon it, it has a curvature to it. It's not flat. And uh, during diastole, when the valve is fully closed, 
it further bends with this curvature. And during systole, when the valve is fully open, it briefly bends against this curvature. And to be able to mimic this, we believe would help in optimizing the opening and closing dynamics of our synthetic heart valve. So bioprosthetics and most tissue engineered heart valves are developed with flat leaflets. And we believe this may actually negatively affect the function. And so this is why we want to try and incorporate the unloaded natural curvature of the leaflets. Um, another sort of design aspect that we're looking into is providing longer leaflets. And this is something that Dr. Winlaw touched on um, earlier today. Uh, and really the, I guess, reason for this is to be able to accommodate growth in children. Uh, so if we have longer leaflets, the assumption is that as the valve expands, we will still have enough material there for sufficient coaptation. Um, and so that's why we really want to try and um, incorporate these longer leaflets in our valve design. Um, and so this slide really um, is here to describe our sort of novel methodology of trying to extract the curvature, the natural curvature from leaflets uh, and putting them into our bio-inspired valve design. Um, and this figure here is actually from uh, a recent paper that we submitted. And uh, I thought I'd share this with everyone today. So uh, essentially we start off with a micro CT scan of a real heart valve. In this case, we used a sheet valve. Uh, we can reconstruct and segment this uh, three, um, micro CT scan into a 3D model. And this 3D model, we can then actually manipulate and modify on computer aided design software or just to shorten it, CAD software. So on this CAD software, we can actually look at this 3D model and identify the best looking leaflet out of the three. Uh, the reason why we're only looking at one is because we believe that symmetry is quite important, not only in terms of the valve design, but also when it comes to fabrication and testing. You don't want something that is um, asymmetrical and has all of these sort of valleys and hills as you would see in a native heart valve. So with this um, single leaflet, we can extract the curvature from it using curvature extraction tools on CAD software. Um, I guess the most important part is really this middle curve here that you can see. So we actually got that from the, the 3D model. Um, and the way that we defined it was using a mathematical equation. So the mathematical equation can then be plotted parametrically on the CAD software. Um, and then we can develop, as you can see here, the leaflet um, shape based on that mathematical equation. And essentially with that leaflet, as we said, we want symmetry. So we can actually mirror it across the central axis to provide a tri-leaflet um, valve that looks like the one at the bottom here. So after we established the design of the valve, I think we already described this as well, but um, we make a mold um, out of, that looks pretty much exactly the same as the design that I just described. And we did some dip coating for fabrication. So essentially taking the mold, dipping it in a solution of polymer, letting it set, and then carefully removing the mold. And then you end up with what you can see on this slide here. Uh, for this valve in particular, we also added a conduit around it to have a valved conduit. So you can see it from the top, bottom, and side view. Um, and I don't know if you can tell from these images, but the material is actually quite thin, just like uh, normal uh, heart valves. Uh, in terms of the material, so the chosen material that we have is a biocompatible and biostable siloxane-based polyurethane. Uh, the material properties, based off of a lot of mechanical tests that we performed, were comparable to native pulmonary heart valves. They can be uh, as well, relatively thin. Um, it's something that we can actually tune during the fabrication process. If we want something thinner, we can do that. If we want something thicker, we can also do that. Um, of course, there is a limitation. It's a tough material, but it's also flexible. And as we like to stress, it's a bio-inert material. And it's also been used um, for other cardiovascular applications, as you may already know from um, Mark's talk. So after establishing the design, the material, and the fabrication process, we also carried out some computational modeling using some finite element analysis. So I think after looking at Luke's talk, this may look very, very simple. This is the most simplest level of computational modeling. Um, it is just a structural analysis, um, just to note that there is no fluid actually being applied here. 
Um, it's really just to look at how the valve would behave when a pressure is being applied to it. It still gives us a lot of valuable information, um, on, but of course we do ultimately want to go on and um, apply a fluid later on. And so here we have a 30 millimeter diameter valve. Uh, and one concept I wanted to mention uh, was this thing called snap through, which is really the term that we gave to a valve that could fully open. Um, and it's essentially that whole concept of during systole, when the valve is fully open, it can bend against its natural curvature. So on the left, you have the valve um, with its natural curvature. And on the right, you can see the snap through occurring where it's bending against that natural curvature. So this study um, was also in the paper that we recently submitted. Um, and it's essentially a way of using computational analysis as a screening tool. So based on the results, you can essentially choose uh, which design gives the best uh, performance. Um, in this case, we only looked at the opening um, for the future. We do definitely wanna look at the closing performance as well. Uh, and some important parameters that we looked at were a snap through, the geometric orifice area, which is essentially just the opening area of the valve, and the stress. And we did this by looking at changes in leaflet thickness, Young's modulus, and leaflet height or length. So um, this is one of the studies that I just brought here so I could just explain how we use it as a screening tool. So for example, we looked at, as I mentioned, the leaflet thickness, Young's modulus, and height, and how increasing those affect the geometric orifice area. And so for leaflet thickness and Young's modulus, increasing each of these actually shows a decrease in the geometric orifice area uh, for the same amount of pressure applied. Um, and on the other side, we have the height. Increasing the height actually increases the geometric orifice area. And in each of these graphs, I have pointed out a red line, which is essentially a threshold for snap through. So anything that is above this red line was able to snap through and anything below it was not. So essentially already from the study, we can sort of tell what kind of parameters we would need in order to have a valve that could snap through or fully open. Okay, so then it decides not to work. <laughs> um, and then another example of a study that we have is looking at the effect of the Young's modulus um, on stress. So on the left-hand side here, there are four figures um, and they all have a Young's modulus that um, is less than 50 megapascal. So we have a range from about five to about 25. Then on the right-hand side, we have a range of Young's modulus from 50 megapascals to about 300, um, just to see the effect on the stress. And what we see is not only that having less than 50 megapascal Young's modulus um, causes snap through and um, complete opening of the valves, we can also see much lower magnitudes of stress from the scale bar. So anything that had the Young's modulus greater than 50 megapascals showed a much higher stress. So essentially that, that is what we mean by using this sort of method as a screening tool. Um, from this study alone, we could already tell that we needed a leaflet thickness of about um, up to 0.3 millimeters, a modulus of less than 50 and megapascals and a longer leaflets were favored over the shorter ones. However, again, with longer leaflets, just something to note, there is a limit to that as well. We don't want them to be so long that they have unwanted sort of twisting motion um, during the transition phase between the closed and open position. Um, and finally, just some preliminary hydrodynamic test results. Um, I think this valve probably doesn't look anywhere as good as Elena's, but this was our first ever prototype that we made. Um, again, a 30 millimeter diameter valve, so slightly bigger. Uh, and we use the following testing conditions in um, cardiac output, heart rate, systolic duration, and mean arterial pressure. This was all based on the ISO 5840 standard. Uh, and so with these um, variations in our testing conditions, we were able to test in nine different conditions. Uh, and essentially the results show a regurgitant fraction of about 14%, pressure gradient of about less than nine millimeters of mercury, and an effective orifice area of about three centimeters squared. And just for some comparison, um, in the ISO 5840, they mentioned that a 31 millimeter valve should have a regurgitant fraction of less than 20% and an EOA of greater than 2.25 centimeters squared. So just based off the ISO standard, we have a relatively um, well-performing valve. Uh, from the video, we can see that there is quite good competence during diastole, but we think that we can definitely improve on the opening of the valve and essentially the way that we 
would do that is just by um, modifying not only the design, but also um, the fabrication process. Uh, we think that we can definitely achieve snap through in our valves um, if we work on those aspects um, and continue to do some hydrodynamic testing in um, specialized pulse duplicator machines. And of course, more advanced computational modeling um, such as with the um, fluid structure interactions with uh, hyperelastic materials. So that's it from me.